on an all-new Dr. Phil. Imprisoned by anxiety. It's rough for all of us because we all tiptoe around us. Lisa says the mood in the household is dependent on how Ted's anxiety is that day. The shades are always drawn. These curtains, he's actually screwed. You say even the dog is showing anxiety. Absolutely down to the dog. It's constant, it's relentless, it pulls you down, it wears you out. Are you ready to change that? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. Ted. Now, Ted says he gets up every morning to send his six-year-old son off to school and then goes back to bed. When Ted wakes up again, he has a shot of vodka, a cigarette, and takes an hour to himself. Then Ted's girlfriend, Lisa, picks out his clothes and cooks him breakfast. After that, and depending on how he's feeling, Ted says he might spend all day watching TV while Lisa caters to his every whim. Ted says he suffers from debilitating anxiety that he says has robbed him of almost every joy in life. Ted's girlfriend Lisa says she spends all day every day walking on eggshells doing everything she possibly can to keep his anxiety at bay. I'm the best at being stressed, let me tell you. Oh my gosh. I knew a knife had to be stabbed in me again before I got sleep. Ted's anxiety has taken over our lives. When his anxiety is high, it is completely chaotic. Everything causes him anxiety. Already, I'm thinking about everything. If my son gets upset, that gives him anxiety. Anything to do with his mom, opening up the mail, driving in the car, leaving the house, gives him anxiety. He hates making phone calls. Even talking to his mother on the phone, he can't deal with it. I need sleep so bad. I'm gonna go crazy, I swear. When Ted's anxiety is really bad, he'll sweat a lot. He has heart palpitations. He really can't concentrate or think. Ted's anxiety usually keeps him up at night. 6.40 p.m. He's been asleep all day. It's rough for all of us because we all tiptoe around him. Ted has certain rules for the house. The doors are locked. The shades are always drawn. And you'll see that. It's taped. These curtains, he's actually screwed. I believe that he has a fear of other people looking in and looking at our family. But there's something, a switch that's been turned off. It's very, very frustrating to be in this situation. But I can't look at him in a mad or angry way. I just can't. I hope that... Dr. Phil can help Ted find peace with his anxiety. I just want a happy family. Well, Lisa says the mood in the household is dependent on how Ted's anxiety is that day. And when it's bad, it's like a hurricane has ripped through the home. Ted usually wakes up at 6 in the morning uh, unless he's been up all night with his anxiety. Wait, wait. wait. I've been a sleepless night. Three to wake up in the afternoon. When he wakes up, uh, he needs an hour to at least get himself together, and I can't discuss any important topics with him. He'll take a shot to calm himself down. Makes you gotta go now. And he'll smoke his first cigarette. That first cigarette is a killer. I automatically, my hands start shaking as soon as the nicotine gets to my body. This is what I'm talking about, what the first cigarette does to me. And it turns on the gloom and doom thoughts. We wait for Dr. Phil to come on at 6 a.m. I like what? to watch Dr. Phil in the morning because it calms me. During the day, we'll watch TV or we'll clean up around the house. If he's having a bad day, it's on the couch and not doing much. We never go out or do anything. I 
am lost at how to help him anymore. Well, joining us virtually is Lisa. Uh, Lisa, how are you? I'm good, Dr. Phil. How you doing? Well, I'm doing very curious, actually. <laughs> yeah. We asked you to rate this relationship on a 1 to 10 scale, and you rated it 7.5. Yeah. That really surprised me, because you say you virtually live to manage his anxiety. You walk on eggshells. You cater to every whim. You have to climb the stairs to get his clothes so he doesn't have to because it makes his heart race. That you aren't even allowed to feel because it triggers his feelings. Wow. How does How is that a 7.5? Well, because I feel it doesn't take away from uh, the love that I have for him or the special moments that we do share. So it's not all doom and gloom every day. No, it is every day. Every day is anxiety and every day it rules the house. And you say you've started to have anxiety. Oh, absolutely. It's rubbed off on me. Um, I see some changes in my son, even. You have a six-year-old. Yes, we do. And you say he's starting to show some signs of anxiety. Yes. Um, and you have a 13-year-old in the home. Yes, I do. Uh, how's it affecting the 13-year-old? Uh, she isolates herself a bit, and uh, I believe she completely realizes that most of my attention is directed towards Ted most of the time, and I think she misses spending more time with me or craves to spend more time with me. Okay, so not good for her. No, not at all. You say even the dog is showing anxiety. Yes absolutely down to the dog. The dog is very weary. Um, and especially if he uh, is upset about something, the dog goes right to my side and will follow me around the whole house for the rest of the night. So days are turning into weeks, and this has been going on for how long? Years. And what, what are you doing about it? I didn't know what else to do for him. I am not doing much. I just cater to how I know he likes to have things and he likes things to be and what makes him comfortable. Other than that, I can't take that feeling away from him. So those are why I do the little things that I do for him because uh -huh. I don't know how else to help and I feel helpless. Okay. So you're not doing anything to change it. Uh, and what you're actually doing is making it possible for him to continue to live the way he is. I agree. You're doing this for you. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense at all. No, it does make sense. It's, it's just ugly. Tomorrow. We're talking about body language. With the behavior panel. Nothing gets past these two. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I'm I. What about the child? I don't think we even heard his name. Family ain't the same without the family. There's a tremendous amount of red flagging going on here. He said, you know, just let's kill your parents. She's trying to uh, almost romance you as she goes along. She was telling the story like you're telling at a slumber party. That's tomorrow. Then on Monday on the premiere episode of Dr. Phil. The doctors told me that my baby would die shortly after birth. She crossed state lines for the right to choose. Carry to bury the abortion debate. That's Monday. A police officer called Nicole in our relationship. Us arguing, that gives him more anxiety. But he says, I like it. If I disagree with something with him, then I'm the one responsible for giving him anxiety. It's not fair. And Ted says he hates his life. I get very offended and hurt. Like, we have a home, we have a beautiful family. We've got a lot to be grateful for.
You know, I've often said there are two things that don't get better with time, bills and problems. <laughs> you get a bill in the mail and just set it on the table, it's not going to get better if you're just sitting there. And problems don't get better if you just ignore them. And right now, we're dealing with a lot of problems. In order for things to change, you have to have a change agent. It's like water flowing in a river. It's going to continue to go the same route for centuries. It will yeah. never change unless somebody comes in and, and reroutes the river. And you're not right. doing anything to reroute the river, right? Right. In right. fact, you're making sure that it's easy for him to do tomorrow what he did today. I understand. You're, you're absolutely right. Okay. How does that help him? It doesn't. How does that As help my... you? It doesn't. How does that help the six-year-old? It doesn't. The 13-year-old? Not at all. How about the dog? <laughs> not at all. Okay, so it's not helping anybody. I just do what I thought was easiest for him. Well, wait a second. I heard you say two things. Yeah. I just heard you say, I'm doing this to avoid confrontation. Yes. Right? Yes. And then you said, I'm doing what's easiest for him. That's two yes. different things. So the first okay. thing is, you're doing this for you because you don't want confrontation. Is that true? Yes, a lot of the times... Uh, if he's miserable and 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 he's feeling a certain way, the whole mood in the house changes. Okay, but I, I want to be sure I understand this. You're saying, I okay. know this isn't helping him. I know it's costing my children, but I don't want to deal with it, so I do it anyway. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense at all. No, it does make sense. It's, it's just ugly. You're, you're saying... I know this doesn't help him, and I know it hurts the children, but it keeps me comfortable, so screw them. I'm going to do what keeps me comfortable. But I'm not really comfortable. Well, but you think you are. You're avoiding conflict, so you, you say, I'm going to throw the kids under the bus and him under the bus so I don't have to confront the situation. I, I just want to be sure I understand that. I've tried to confront the situation. Well, that's not what you said. Look, I can explain I wanna... this. I can explain this to you, but I can't understand it for you. Okay, <laughs> I understand. I, no, I don't want confrontation in the house, so I just try to keep everybody happy. But it's not obviously. Oh, well, you're trying how to the keep your, you're, you're trying to keep yourself happy because we already have decided it's not helping him and it's not helping the kids. It's just keeping you from having to deal with it. I didn't look at it as being selfish, but I I see what you mean. Well, you're taking the line of least resistance for you. It's easier to not rock the boat, right? Yes. That's, that wasn't your intention when you started it, but that's how it works out. I mean, I, I know that's not easy to hear, but yeah, that's the effect of what you're doing because you're not helping yeah, you're him, you're not helping the kids, but it is kind of keeping the lid on it for you. You're right. Are you ready to change that? One million percent, yes. Because if you're not, you're in the wrong place. No. This is why I wrote into you. Because I call a spade a damn shovel. And, right. And that, this <laughs> is what I'm saying. This, this, that's why enabling is so ugly. Enabling is kind of an easy word to say, but what it really involves is pretty ugly. Right. Enabling is to make something possible, practical, or easy for someone to do or be, and often perpetuates the problem. And that's what you're doing, right? Absolutely. Well, Lisa says she rated her relationship a 7.5, like I said. But Ted, who gets all this service, he just rates it a 4 or 5. Uh, we're going to meet him after the break. Oh, my gosh.
My anxiety is the worst it's ever been. Blow up will come in the mail. Oh, they're gonna cancel me. I don't like taking pictures of myself. I don't want to be attractive. I definitely feel like I live in a prison in my mind. I want to talk about things that need to be talked about. Hate crimes in the U.S. rose last year to the highest level in more than a decade. Why am I being targeted? Just for looking the way I am. It gets worse stuff to sell. The carnage in our nation's schools has become painfully repetitive. I just started screaming her name, but I never heard anything back. The police officers simply failed you. More intense, more inclusive, more informative than ever. The defunding plan has failed. It's a complete disaster. People will do desperate things in order to survive. You're not solving anything by arresting those people. We're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to solve a problem. The customers seem to be losing their cool at the drop of a hat. What the hell is going on? If you miss a day, you miss a lot. Oh, look about that. Ted says he's had anxiety since he was 17 years old, and things have only gotten worse. So, of course, the question I want to have is, what's he been doing about it since he's 17? He says he lives in constant pain, and he wants nothing more than to get his life back. But has he behaved that way? Take a look. As soon as I open my eyes in the morning, I get a flash of what's wrong, and I automatically just start thinking negative things, and my heart rate increases. My anxiety is the worst probably it's ever been. Oh, my God. You know, I knew it. Something had to happen. My anxiety causes me to catastrophize. An envelope will come in the mail, my health insurance or something. And I automatically think, oh, they're going to cancel me, or this is bad news. It's ridiculous. I don't like taking pictures of myself. I never think they look right. I don't want to be attractive. My stomach has to be tighter. It's just never good enough. I am fanatical about cutting my hair because I cut my own hair. Two mirrors and using both hands. But then there's this thing that's really like sucking me down and I know all I gotta go through. It's just hard to do. The anxiety that I have, it's almost like a carrot that hangs from the stick in front of the donkey that he can never reach. Looking at my keyboard, wanting so bad to do the music, but I just can't. And I have over 200 songs. This far into the maze, my crazies or anyone out there that can save me. Maybe I'm open. So it's not like I physically can't. It's not letting me. I definitely feel like I live in a prison in my mind. Well, also joining us virtually is Ted. Ted, it's good to meet you. Good to meet you, Dr. Phil. You've been watching me a long time. Yes, I have. Every day. Yeah, pretty much every day. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, I, I'm curious. You said you want this to change uh, more than anything. True? True. Why? Because it's robbing my life. You think it affects you as a father, as a partner, as a... as a songwriter as a performer every aspect of your life this this takes away yes sir as it does there are some things that you do uh you ride your bike sometimes in the evening you get up for your son and uh get him off to school how do you accomplish that uh, uh those things seem to be natural to me you know just the Man, I'm not just uh, not having people around mm -hmm. that I have to worry about what I look like or or, or what if I'm going to say something wrong or anything like that's why, you know, this is this is even hard for me right now. Your anxiety when it comes up, just what's the physical experience you have with anxiety? What What happens? My heart pounds real hard. Uh -huh. Like so, sometimes to the point where you can see my shirt flutter. Uh huh. 
and uh, I start sweating. Right. My hands get cold, my feet get cold, and uh, I just start thinking doom and gloom thoughts and all the things that I have to do in the future and how am I going to take care of it all. And just on and on and on. It's just like a computer that does not stop in my head. Okay, so let's let's go over it again. Your your heart, you get heart palpitations. Your heart pounds. Yeah, uh, heart pounds. Your so. extremities get cold. Yes. Uh, you break out into sweats and you get flush, right? Yes. And you left out one that I've seen. You you shows where your hands, you get tremors in your hands. You you shake. Yeah, in the in the morning, mostly when I smoke. Yeah. A cigarette. All right. And then you say you catastrophize. You start thinking everything that could possibly go wrong, gloom and doom, something's going to happen, and, and you, you, you're you afraid to be happy because if you are, sure enough, something bad will happen. Or I'm waiting for it to yeah. go wrong. It's like if I let myself be happy, I'm just asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that drains you. You don't have any energy, right? Because it's like it, this is wears you out. Yeah, it's like uh, me, main maintaining this beast inside of me all day long. Yeah, you know, I, I can physically feel tired by like four o'clock, like I've been working all day. Okay, so inside you, you, your heart pounds. You get cold hands, cold feet. Uh, you, you break out into sweats. You sometimes have tremors. Uh, you get fatigued. It's exhausting. And then you have catastrophic thoughts that are just paralyzing. Correct. Correct. Right? Okay. Yes. Do, do, have I got it? Yeah. For, yeah. Basically, yeah. Well, not, not basically. Just, if I'm missing anything. Okay. It's constant. It's not like, oh, I'm having a little bit of anxiety right now. It's just all day long. It's like a big, it just, it just hangs on you all the time, like dragging yeah. you down. Or like boot roots growing out of your boots. You know what yeah. I mean? Like just trying to keep me there. Yeah. yeah. It just makes it hard to do anything. Yeah. Okay. Have I got it? You got the basic uh, gist of it. Yeah. Ted says he is always worried about how he looks, acts, speaks. So much so, he can't even go outside without worrying about that people are judging him. I got it. We'll talk more about it next. From navigating... It takes me away. But sing out loud with no restriction. It's so freeing. Ghosts in my head from a time I was almost dead. And now they trying to crawl back in the bed. They said I wouldn't make it. Make them stop. I can't take it. Fall Down was the song I wrote about my people, my society, the world, and also about myself. Make mistakes. 
or suffer so easily. I like making music that's truthful, music that's real. Lisa says her boyfriend Ted doesn't ever want to do anything. He, she says it's hard to watch him spiral further uh, into this lifestyle while also having to tiptoe around how he's feeling each and every moment of each and every day. Do you two care about each other? Yes. Def definitely. Are, are you glad you're in a relationship? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ted, do you want Lisa to be happy? Yes. Yes, I do. As a couple, you guys want to be together and laugh and talk and, you know, go out and enjoy yourselves and have friends yeah. and a Absolutely. social life and a, uh, just really enjoy the world, yeah. right? Yeah. How important sure. is it, do you think, to be good role models for your children? I don't think it's, it's everything. The most it's important. In, do you guys think you're being good role models now? Uh, we could be better. Yeah. Are both of y'all sober? For you, the most part, yeah. You, you've, no, both been, be you've both been addicted to opioids in the past, right? Uh, yes. yes. From a doctor, not like street right. crazy. But are you both clean and sober now? I take my medications that are prescribed to me. Uh-huh. And, and, uh... I'll have a, uh, a shot of alcohol in the morning sometimes to calm me down to get grounded. Okay, so I know that was so that's a no. You're you're not clean and sober. No, I guess if you consider that drinking yeah. in the morning, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. I do consider that. Uh, Lisa says her six-year-old son is now showing signs of anxiety. She says he's crying in school, always wants to be around them and. This is happening a lot because kids have been home uh, during quarantine and have really regressed some and gone back to dependency on parents. And I suspect that's exacerbated in this situation, but it's very widespread right now. So what do we do about that? And I'm going to answer that question when we come back. talking about body language with the behavior panel nothing gets past these two i can't eat i can't sleep i'm i what about the child i don't think we even heard his name family the same without family there's a tremendous amount of red flagging going on here he said you know just let's tell your parents she's trying to uh, almost romance you as she goes along she was telling the story like you're telling at a slumber party that's tomorrow then on monday on the premiere episode of Dr. Phil. The doctors told me that my baby would die shortly after birth. She crossed state lines for the right to choose. Carrie to bury the abortion debate. That's Monday. Closed captioning provided by... I do feel guilty at times because most of my attention is directed towards Ted and not our children. My son's six, and I do see some of Ted's anxiety rubbing off on Chase. Chase has heard us arguing, and it's heartbreaking for both of us. My relationship with my son, Chase, is it's beautiful. When I'm with him, or he gives me a hug. He's just peace for me. Ted is scared that his anxiety will affect Chase. He has said that all he wants is to break this generational curse and for Chase to be a happy and confident boy. Well, I'm here with Lisa and Ted, and Ted says that his anxiety is so debilitating that it has taken him away from everything that he loves in his life. And joining me now to help unpack all of this is Dr. Charles Sophie. Now, he is a child and family psychiatrist, and he is really an expert in these matters. He is a former medical director of the L.A. County Department of Child and Family Services. Uh, he's also a member of the Dr. Phil Advisory Board. And I, thank you for being here, Dr. Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. You and I have done a, a, a deep dive into this. Yep. You've been through everything that 
I've been through. I was just asking uh, the two of them about being clean and sober because both of them have been addicted to opioids in the past. Right. Uh, prescription. Right. That doesn't change the chemistry of it. Right. Uh, if they've been addicted to opioids in the past. And now uh, Ted is taking Suboxone, Xanax, uh, drinking in the morning right. uh, vodka. Right. Uh, at times in the past, he's had a lot more vodka, but now he's doing it just in the morning. And Lisa, uh, you're taking what at this point, Lisa? I uh, prescribe this Suboxone and Xanax as well. Okay. Xanax is highly addictive, correct? The most highly addictive medication out there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's you're going to get hooked on that faster than anything. Yeah, and you're going to eat it up, and you're going to need more and more and more. Because your body starts to adapt, and yes. so you need more to have yes. it effective. All right. Yes. So in terms of what you're seeing here, what jumps out at you the most? Well, I think, like you said earlier, there's two addicts that are trying to be sober, but they're sort of sober. And you can't be sort of sober. It's just like if you're, when you're pregnant, you're either pregnant or you're not. You're either sober or you're not. And just because there's this understanding that somebody prescribes my medication and I'm not buying them off the street doesn't mean you're not an addict or that you're addicted. So I think they're fooling themselves by trying to say they're sober, but they're not. You've got Ted that is struggling with anxiety and Lisa who is enabling it to the point of ridiculousness. Yes. I also think that, Ted, maybe you don't know, you may not have full anxiety that you feel as anxiety. You could be in a detox situation in between each drink or each pill, and you're just chasing yourself. Do you see what I mean? So until you're totally sober, you're never going to have that answer. I understand what you're saying. We don't have a baseline, Ted. We don't know what we have to work with with you, and you say you've tried therapy in the past, but, Lisa, you say he hasn't made a sustained commitment to therapy for 12 years. No, it's it's not come up. We've... I think it, it goes with everything that his anxiety does to him with the phone calls and the leaving the house. And even though he wants help, it's just never got to that point where I could get him to a doctor. Okay, well, it's not a matter of you getting him to a doctor. You know, Ted, listen, here, here's the thing. If this is robbing you of your life and you've, you've got children in the home and you, you've got your son for whom you are the most powerful role model in his life, and this is something that has been robbing you for so many years, it, it comes down to the question, what are you doing about it? Right. And I'm going to get the answer from you right after the break. Ted had a very hard upbringing. His deceased father would call him an ugly and he was very militant. And I think that's where all of his anxiety comes from. My father, he was a Green Beret. One time my mom asked me, why are you walking on your tiptoes? I would walk on my tiptoes because if I hit the wall and make a mark, all hell is gonna break loose. My dad wouldn't specifically say, you're not good enough. He just always gave me the sense that I could never do things right. Ted, what are you doing to overcome this? Historically, over the last several years, what are you doing to overcome it? It's, it's strange, like, when I hear uh, the other doctors answer and uh, I think about everything, I feel like I have done everything on God's earth to look for answers. Um, every doctor you could name programs, year-long programs that I completed, everything that I've ever tried to do for this anxiety, I always excelled through the programs or whatever, And but it just 
never changed whatever's happening inside of me. I feel like, you know, that's why we were trying to get in touch with you. Because I feel like there's, I don't know what else to do. I, and we, we have spoken about therapy and um, brought it up. And yeah, we need to do it. Next thing, my mom's in the hospital. And I don't want to make excuse, excuses. Like okay, that. well then let's go. Let, okay, let me interrupt you because okay. you know time is time is important here. Okay. It here's what it boils down to: the road to hell is paved with good intentions. What I want to know is what have you done? And Lisa says you haven't done anything in a sustained fashion for years. Lisa, true or false? No, I've watched him try to work on himself. I, I really have. As far as that would be the only thing is therapy. What do you mean the only thing? He's, he's done everything the except only... therapy? Yes. He's worked on himself. He's tried different routines. <clears throat> he's, he's tried to uh, uh, read books, uh, anything he could do to try to feel better. But the one thing would be therapy in our time together. Okay, so you've done everything to get this under control except go to people who professionally are trained to get it under control. And, and let me just tell you, this is not something that you do for a week or a month or two months or three months, you do it until. If this is something that is important to you, it is important to your family, important to your son, important to your stepdaughter, important to you, you do it until you get it under control. You don't do it for a week or a month. You do it until you succeed. You don't ever stop until you unlock the, the lock and get in the door you need to get in. This isn't, you, you work to criteria. You do this until you get where you need to go. I want to talk about things that need to be talked about. Hate crimes in the U.S. rose last year to the highest level in more than a decade. The Why am I being targeted? Just for looking the way I am. It gets worse, Dr. Phil. <laughs> The carnage in our nation's schools has become painfully repetitive. I just started screaming her name. But I never heard anything like that. The police officers, we failed you. More intense, more inclusive, more informative than ever. The defunding plan has failed. It's a complete disaster. People will do desperate things in order to survive. You're not solving anything by arresting those people. We're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to solve a problem. The customers seem to be losing their cool at the drop of a hat. What the hell is going on? If you miss a day, you miss a lot. Oh. This is not something for which there is no fix. This is not some incurable disease. Right. This is one of those things that you can do. But you can say, well, I'm going to do this, or I tried this and it didn't work, so I quit and read a book. No, you need to do what you have to do to get this under control. And you can't do it if you're addicted to drugs and getting up in the morning and, and, and drinking and smoking cigarettes and going back to bed. You need professional help on a sustained basis, and you can turn this around. Am I right or am I wrong? You're 100% right, but they can't turn it around unless they're sober. Sober is the first step. And, and Lisa, you're fired. Okay. This is not your job. That's right. good news. You just lost your job. Your job is to be a mother and, and to be his partner. It is not to be his mother, his therapist, his, his fixer. This is over your pay grade. It is not your job. You need to take care of you and partner with him. But you're not his therapist. You can't fix this. I, I get it. I get it. Just like you yeah. said, you get it. Yeah. I know. I don't. I don't want to take Suboxone. I'm tired of it. It's like you traded one thing for another. Right. 
even though it doesn't make you feel anything, I don't want to take that stupid thing in the morning. I don't. I'm tired of having to make sure I have my four for the day of anxiety medication with me everywhere I go, just in case, you know? I understand. Good. It's got to... It's just got to go. It's got to go. It all has to go. Get and, clear and it takes medical supervision to do this. Yes, and you can be specific with them about that. Yep. And we, we can do that after this. But I'm, I'm telling you, if, if you start there and then we talk about a, a sustained therapeutic intervention, right. then you got a different ball game. But it starts there and you can talk with them yep. about the medical supervision of yep. that and how to do this safely. Right. For more information about today's episode, log on to drphil.com. And do not forget to subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks. You also want to listen to Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret. Check it out on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll see you next time. I'm very optimistic about you, too. <laughs>